Welcome everybody to Equipping the Body. I'm Dr. Brad Starnes and today we are going to be starting our new study on the book of James, the book of James. And I've outlined the first eight verses of chapter one. This is a sermon I preached here at Cedar Shoals Baptist Church where I'm privileged to serve as senior pastor. And I'm going to re-record these sermons on our podcast through the book of James. So as I'm preaching through the book of James at Cedar Shoals on Sundays, I'm going to come back into my office and re-record these messages in podcast format. And so the book of James is where we're going to start next. Now, the book of James is a very practical letter, and I want to briefly cover the background of that letter. Now, in the Bible, there are a few James uh, connected with Jesus in the New Testament. First, we have James, the brother of John, son of Zebedee. And second, we have James, son of Alphaeus, brother of Judas, and not Iscariot. Then finally, we have James, the brother of Jesus, in the flesh. He was a little brother to Jesus, born after the Lord himself. Now, the question is, when we come to the book of James in our New Testament, which one wrote the letter? Was it James, the brother of John? Was it James, the son of Alphaeus? Or was it James, the brother of Jesus, our Lord? So, which one is it? Well, we know it wasn't John's brother because he was dead before the book was written. He was slain by Herod shortly after Pentecost, according to the book of Acts. Now, secondly, we know that it can't be James, the brother of Judas, because there's no evidence internally or externally that supports that. And so that finally leaves us with one option, and that's James, the brother of Jesus, according to the flesh. Now, this makes perfect sense because James, the brother of Jesus, was a leader in the church of Jerusalem, according to Acts chapter 15. In fact, Paul the Apostle called him a pillar of the church. And so the fact of the matter is, I believe all evidence points in the direction that it's James, the Lord's brother, who is the author. Now, the ironic thing is, he was not always a believer. He thought his brother to be crazy until after the resurrection. Most likely, James was in the number of Jesus' siblings who criticized our Lord in John chapter 7, verse 5. Now, for his audience, he is writing to believing Jews. These were Jews who had accepted Christ, but still mingled with the practicing followers of Judaism as it was understood in the first century. This was a messy point in church history. As Ironside said, at this point in church history, the synagogue had not yet fully separated from the church, as it were. Now, for the book of James itself, it gives us as believers a lot of practical instruction for living as a Christian in an unchristian world. And so, what more could be a, excuse me, what could be a more relevant book to study in the hour in which we find ourselves? Now, as for the passage we're going to deal with first, Uh, We need to talk about that. And so I want to read that to you now. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And the Bible says this, James, a brother, a bondservant of God, rather, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You know, it's human nature when something bad happens for us to long for some sort of solution or quick fix or escape. When trials come our way, whether they be physical, financial, spiritual, emotional, having to do with our jobs, our family, or our friends, we often spend more time loathing the trial than seeking to learn from the trial. I mean, let's get real. How many of us, when we something bad happens, the first thing we think is, gee, thanks, Jesus, for allowing this to happen to me. I cannot wait to see what I'm going to learn. 
Nobody thinks that way in their natural state. Our natural man does not think that way. However, by the eyes of faith, we can learn to see the value of these valleys in our lives. And this can lead us to face our trials with joy, as James talks about in our passage today. So I've entitled the message, The Value of Valleys, Facing Trials Joyfully. The Value of Valleys, Facing Trials Joyfully. And so as James is writing to Jewish Christians who are dispersed throughout the known world at that time, facing much persecution and trials of various sorts, he begins to reveal in the first part of chapter 1 that there is value in these trials, or as I've called them, the valley. Now you remember, if you've grown up in church, the old saints used to call hard times valleys. They'd say, pray for me, I'm in a valley. They'd say, we're going through a valley in our lives. And so I've borrowed that term from the church of yesteryear to entitle this message in a pithy way, there is value in the valley. And so the question then becomes, well, what is the value of the valley? If you're listening today and you're going through some type of valley, some type of trial, you're asking yourselves, what in the world is this guy talking about? What is the value of the valley? Well, I believe the text reveals three values of the valley. The first value of the valley is endurance. Endurance in verses 1 through 3 we'll find that. The second value of the valley is spiritual maturity. We'll find that. And the third value of the valley is wisdom. Wisdom. So there are three values of the valley or three things we can learn from trials that James shows us. Endurance, spiritual maturity, and wisdom. Now in verses 1 through 3 that I just read to you a moment ago, we first find a greeting from James. He introduces himself as the author. He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to note his obvious humility. He and Jesus had the same mom, yet he only saw himself as just another believer and no better than anyone else. And truly he was not. But could you imagine the temptation to say to all the other believers, Y'all listen to me. I grew up with Jesus. I know best. After all, Jesus is my brother. Do what I say. But you see, by faith, he no longer saw Jesus as his brother, but as his Lord and Savior and Master. Now let me make a point of application. Our view of Jesus changes when we are truly born again. He is no longer a religious figure, a philosopher, just another famous person from the pages of history. But to the child of God, he is Lord, Savior, Master, and King. Next notice in verse 2, he gives us the audience. He says, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now why would he be primarily writing to Jewish Christians? Now that's not a complex answer. The church that he served at was in Jerusalem. And it was primarily made up of converted Jews. Ethnic Jews who had received Christ by faith and believed him to be the Messiah of the Old Testament prophecies. Jerusalem was the holy city of the Jews. And so naturally among the population of its Christ followers were predominantly Jewish. Now then he moves on to point to the point of the passage. He gives us the first value of the valley. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now before we go any further, let us just appreciate the irony of what he is saying. Consider trials or valleys as I've called them as joyful, as something to enjoy. Who in the world gets joy when something bad happens? What sense does that make? Can joy exist during such great sorrow? It can when you see and experience the value of the valley. You see, friend, you learn things in the valleys that mountaintops could never teach you. It is easy to go on and serve God during the good times, but it is the hard times that produce results. As the old saying goes, pressure makes diamonds. Or, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So, notice also the certainty of these valleys. 
He did not say if you fall into various trials. Rather, he said when you fall into various trials. We are guaranteed by virtue of following Christ to encounter trials in our faith. I mean, how could we not? We have three enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh. Surely there will be bumps and bruises. I remind you also that Jesus himself said, it will rain on the just and the unjust. And so trials and valleys are just part of life, but even more so for the Christian because Jesus said to follow him, you must take up a cross, that's an instrument of torture, deny yourself and follow him. Paul echoes the same thing as James is saying here, and Jesus also said when Paul told Timothy that all who live godly shall suffer persecution. I mean, hard times are a part of life, even for unbelievers, yet we are called as believers to approach valleys in a radically different way. And so he says these trials, this testing of your faith produces patience. Now the word patience here could be more appropriately translated as the word endurance. It comes from the Greek word hupomene, excuse me, getting tongue-tied, tongue-tied reading my own notes. Hupomone, hupo meaning under and meno meaning to abide. So literally to abide under, it, it carries the idea of a man holding a great burden on his back and just when it seems it's about to collapse upon him, he endures. And so James uses it in the passive. He says to abide under trials or to withstand trials. Ladies and gentlemen, our faith must be put to the test for at least two reasons. First of all, to prove whether it is genuine or not. Because Jesus spoke of those who received the seed, but at the first sign of trouble, they withered. Now we know that from the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. So nothing reveals real faith like a test. Secondly, our faith is tested to be strengthened. And this cannot take place in good times. Good times create lazy men. Hard times create strong men. This, by virtue, requires pressure. And as I said a moment ago, pressure makes diamonds. Now, the word faith here is to be understood as your personal faith in and with Jesus Christ. Your walk as a believer, if you will. Is it real? And if it's real, is it strong? Is it a faith that endures? There's only one way to find out, and that's valleys. And so the first value of the valley, according to James, is endurance. Now I want to illustrate this point with something Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. He said, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so Peter echoes the same thing James is saying, that the first value of the valley is endurance. Our walks with Christ require endurance, and there's only one way to get it, and that's pressure. And so the valley produces spiritual endurance by strengthening our faith and also by showing us that our faith is real. And remember what Peter said, the genuineness of your faith is more precious than gold because all the gold in the world cannot buy you a ticket to heaven, but genuine faith in Jesus Christ is the key to heaven by way of repentance and what we call salvation or, to put it as plain as I can, getting saved. That's when the, faith, the gift of faith imparted by the Holy Spirit is exercised in the person and, worship of, uh, person and work of Jesus Christ and a person is made right with Jesus. So the first value of the valley is endurance. Let me give you another illustration to help drive this home. Consider the runner. He begins running short distances. But every time he goes out running, he runs a little farther and a little harder. And so after this intensive training, when it's complete, let patience have its work, he can run faster and longer than ever before. Now those sprints hurt, the stretching and the workouts hurt, but the product 
is worth more than gold. And so the first value of the valley is endurance. The second value of the valley comes to us in verse 4, and that is spiritual maturity. Let me read verse 4 to you once again. James says this, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. The word for complete here connotates maturity. The Greek word is teleos, and it means brought to its end, full grown, mature. Now, James is not speaking of physical maturity clearly, but rather spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity does not come by age as physical maturity. It comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in us through the process of sanctification. And one of the ways he furthers our sanctification is by testing us through trials so that we may see the value of valleys. And so he says, let patience or endurance have its perfect work. You have to let it work. So many times in the valley, the first question we ask is, how do I get out? How can I get out of this situation? When James is telling us, we should be asking, what can I learn from this? How can I get closer to Jesus in this moment or in this situation? How is God shaping me in this? Let patience have its work. Those are the type of questions that reveal an increase in spiritual maturity. When somebody is spiritually mature because they've been through valleys, They approach valleys differently and they will see the value in them more so than someone who is a babe in Christ because they've been there before. Experience is another word we could use to describe this paradigm that I'm trying to lay out for you. Instead of constantly complaining in our valleys, we should be seeking the Lord in our darkest hours. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should not have emotions or concerns, etc. It's okay to grieve, but not to grumble. This is a sign of spiritual maturity. Now, what are the marks of spiritual maturity? You can see it in individuals when they do not get their way. How do they react? When they face a trial, how do they react? Spiritual maturity. It comes through valleys, and that's why it's one of the value of the valley, so that when you go through it, you're mature and you don't lack anything. You're able to walk closer with Christ to serve Him more efficiently. Now, one of the best examples of spiritual maturity to me from the Scripture would be Peter. Oh, Peter, he was a quick-tempered, foul-mouthed, spoke too soon, inconsistent fisherman. However, as the years passed and he faced trials and valleys, God took that same man and brought him to spiritual maturity, used him to write two books of the Bible and to lead the church at Rome. Now that doesn't sound like the same immature Peter, does it? But through trials, through valleys, the Holy Spirit worked in Peter to bring him to maturity, to bring him tilios to full grown in a spiritual sense. And so the second value of the valley per verse number four is spiritual maturity. But then we come to the next and final value of the valley, and that's this, wisdom. The third value of the valley is wisdom, verses five through eight. Let me read them to you again for the sake of clarity. He says in verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." And so the next value of the valley is wisdom. When facing a trial, especially one you've never faced, you will need the wisdom of God not only to get through it, but to learn from it. Let me say that again. That needs to be said again. When facing a trial, especially one you've never faced, you will need the wisdom of God not only to get through it, but to learn from it. And so James says in the context of going through trials, or as we've called them colloquially, values, valleys. 
He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. Heard a preacher say this one time, the only liberal we like is a liberal giver. Well, God gives liberally. That means he gives abundantly, overflowingly, more than we could ever desire when we ask him for wisdom. We see that God is the source of all wisdom. How often in our valleys do we get on our phone and call a friend, a co-worker, a church member, etc., looking for advice? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to seek advice. Surely not, because the Bible says in Proverbs more than once that there is value in godly wisdom. However, why do we not pray first? Look to the word of God first. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He is the ultimate source. Did he not create and design the universe? Surely that required wisdom. Did he not design salvation's plan for sinful man? The Bible says that he, even his supposed foolishness in 1 Corinthians is wiser than man. Why would you seek the wisdom of a creature when you could seek wisdom from the Creator? Let me say that twice because it was so nice. Why would you seek wisdom from another creature when you could get wisdom from the Creator? He promises to answer. Look at what James said. He said it will be given to him. Not a might be given, but it will be given. You have a promise on the authority of God's word. Whatever you face in life, if you will seek the Lord, he will show you how to get through it, what to learn from it, and how to grow from it, etc. Yet there is a caveat. James warns that we must not ask doubting because that's unstable. Now, what does that look like? Well, when you pray to God to ask him to help you through a trial, but then you immediately go back to trying to fix it on your own. That's double-minded. That's doubting God, even if it's unconsciously. When you lay the burden of that trial on the altar at the end of a church service, and then spiritually speaking, you pick it back up before you go back to your seat, you're asking in doubt. You're being double-minded. Now back to the general point of these last verses. The value of the valley is wisdom. It is hard to gain wisdom in the good times when everything is fine and you're not having to make decisions that are costly and you're not facing any type of difficulty. But wisdom comes from facing things you have never seen before. And wisdom comes from the Lord working through you in those situations. The third value of the valley is wisdom. When you face a trial, have you ever stopped to think what can be learned from this? What wisdom can be gained in order to pass on to others? Do you immediately go to a man or do you trust God enough to seek his advice and his wisdom through prayer and his word? At its heart, this is really a trust issue. Now, I want to say this. The valley of trials is painful. We experience hardships that we do not understand, and some of them we never asked for. We encounter problems out of nowhere, such as the course of human existence. We live in a fallen world where tragedy is a result of the fall. However, as strange as it may sound, there is value in the valley for believers. And those three values are endurance, spiritual maturity, and wisdom. The next trial you face, remember that and seek the Lord earnestly. Now perhaps you're here today, you're listening to me, you've read the scripture, you've seen it exposed and applied, but you're facing a trial that no one else knows about. I want to encourage you to go to the feet of Jesus and lay it in his nail-scarred hands. Ask him to teach you, to be with you. And what you'll find is when it's over, you might not necessarily find it in the middle, but when it is over, you will look back at the value of that valley and you'll see that you've increased in endurance, you've increased in spiritual maturity, and you've increased in wisdom. And you know that your faith is real and it's stronger than it's ever been. There is value in the valley. 
I hope you'll join us next time here on Equipping the Body.